strikes her heart. Welcome to Community Journal, Channel 18's program. And today we're coming to you from this afternoon. How about that? And our guest is uh, Matt Cannon, the uh, outreach coordinator for the Howard Conservation Trust, and Michael Lack, the executive director. And uh, Michael, you're going to start off with... Uh, Talking about um, the herring, herring count, herring and count. I just want to say thanks for having us, Paul, and your okay. <laughs> and your crew and your volunteers and the great staff here at Channel 18. And you um, didn't know it was going to rain. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to say um, that Matt's been promoted um, at, as director of land stewardship now. Director of um, land so that's, there's some new. That, no, no, that, that's that's news. So you can and now everybody knows. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and we appreciate all the good work that he does um, yeah, managing good. lands and, and many other um, stewardship initiatives, citizen science projects, all sorts of activities that we're engaged in. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and one of which, good segue, is the uh, annual right. herring count. Right. Um, and I'll let Matt fill us in about how that experience went this year. Sure. So uh, our herring count is one of the flagship citizen science projects that we help organize um, we've done it for many years in coordination with the Town of Harwich Natural Resource Department and I think early on even the Cape Cod uh, Commercial Fishermen's Alliance. Um, so each year we have about 60 volunteers and they've made it through this April and May um, counting river herring that come up from the Sargasso Sea, Nantucket Sound and up through our Johnson's Flume right here in Harwich. and. Um, make a seven mile journey from the sound all the way up, that's Johnson's Flume right there, you can see through there, um, seven miles up eventually to Long Pond. So they, they have quite a journey they make and they live in salt water, they spawn in fresh water. Yeah. So, uh, isn't that amazing? Yeah. You look at the, uh, the photo there of them schooling and the one before that was of that herring, uh, Climbing, vaulting, swimming up the the um, ladder there uh, between West Reservoir and I was up to the Herring River, the, the one they have here in uh, Howitch, and uh, I can see they fly over the place. Yeah, they can they get really quite the uh, momentum. Really know. Yeah, they're, they're, they're determined. <laughs> they're, 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 Very determined. They're zooming up there. Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, right at that spot, you can see great um, scenic views of ospreys coming down and mm -hmm. gulls. You see all the fish swimming around right before they enter the flume there. And so our count is, is farther upstream. And again, we have about 60 volunteers, high school students, people of all ages come out and um, have helped us count April and May through even days like this. They're <laughs> out there counting fish. And all of that data is used um, at the state level to make informed decisions for how we manage that fishery because they are threatened uh, species. And uh, how, how did it work last year? Of course, it's too soon to know how it's going to work this year. Sure. So overall, uh, last year was a down year compared to previous years, um, but we still need more years of data. They're all historically down from the millions of estimated fish we had um, a long time ago so yes, we know I think yeah it's not good news right we hope to that the citizen science effort to monitor and count the fish and compile the data with other counting programs around uh, runs across the Cape uh, will help uh, fishery managers um, at the state level and their partners mm -hmm. make decisions about um, river herring health um, because it is a closed fishery now. Uh, yes. There's no taking um, uh, of the fish allowed. You remember way back when, and actually not far, <laughs> not that long ago. <laughs> yeah. No, it isn't. Uh, I was a little over a decade, good, yeah. you could, still could. Um, and of course, decades and a century or more ago, um, it was a very robust fishery. But because of um, issues with uh, water pollution and uh, impacts to um, water quality of spawning areas, obstructions to um, fish migration, it all had a, an, um, uh, an impact on the health of the fishery. Midwater trawlers taking um, herring schools out of the ecosystem. Uh, one of the ways HCT helps, of course, is to preserve land. 
um, that protects water quality, whether it be coastal water quality or ponds that the fish mm -hmm. are migrating to. So, yeah, it all, it's a big puzzle. <laughs> so we'll see how the count officially comes uh, later in the year. The Association to Preserve Cape Cod compiles all the data for the yes. Cape. Now, for all the data, they used to compile what they did here in Howard's, but now that goes into a general count. Oh, in order to get a sense of yes. the health of the population? Yes. They, I think, distinguish by run. Yes. Um, so I don't know if they actually group all the run numbers together. But you are right. It's one part of a, the equation, um, gathering that data. Yes. Yeah. So we thank all the volunteers this year who were out there in rainy days and with some days of no counts. Um, we really appreciate all the volunteer efforts. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do. Yes, yes, yes. It's an important job. Yeah, and, and speaking of volunteers, we're having them also, uh, or asking folks for uh, help in sharing their yeah. sightings of box turtles. Box turtles, yes. Another citizen science initiative. And those are little uh, turtles. Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe not much bigger than a, a grapefruit, we'll say. It could be a little larger, um, but um, there they have that pattern, uh, and every pattern is different on the carapace or the top shell of the box turtle, that orange and yellow, look at that, um, and dark brown and black, that starburst pattern. Um, and again, each one is unique. Look at how the light uh, catches on that shell. Now and they don't go very far from home, right? That's right. You're right, Paul. They have a very strong uh, home range affinity. Uh, they'll move uh, longer distances this time of year in search of mates, uh, nesting right. areas. Yeah. Um, and especially after heavy rain, May, June-ish <laughs> especially. After today, they may right. go. Yes. Run, huh? Yep, yep. <laughs> um, so what we're asking folks to do now, there's an interesting mm. photo. Um, I saw this one crossing the double yellow line. Everybody's familiar with the double yellow line down the, uh, the stripe down the, the road. And so you can see this turtle crossing. Uh, we ask people if they see turtles crossing, if folks feel that they are safe, uh, meaning pulling over to the side of the road um, w without risk to their own personal safety from other traffic, that they move these turtles to the other side of the road in the same direction they were headed. Because yeah. turtles uh, move with purpose. <laughs> they may move slow and steady, but they move, um, they know where they're going. Um, that's an amazing photo by our volunteer, mm. uh, Janet DiMattia. That we're asking volunteers to share their sightings of turtles with us at Harwich Conservation Trust um, so that we can uh, document their relative distribution around town uh, and understand where they are in relation to areas we've already protected and areas we would like to preserve. Um, they are a state-listed species, uh, species of special concern, meaning essentially they're a rare species, and that's because of habitat loss primarily, mm -hmm. also mortality due to um, road yes. uh, conflicks, um, crossing well, I think the road. There are more, car more cars on the road every, yes. every year. Right, so we're, we're asking folks to uh, sign up for our e-newsletter um, where we have also, we've already uh, distributed instructions to uh, folks interested in sharing their box turtle sightings. We're also going to put a web page uh, on our site, harwichconservationtrust.org, where people can just click a link and find out more information, how they can fill out the form um, that's affiliated with the, the state. It's called a rare animal observation form. And once they fill that out and then send that to um, those folks who see those turtles and document them and snap a photo because everybody seems to have a photo within their phone <laughs> these days, uh, then we can file that information with the state and understand where these turtles are showing up. i got to admit, I haven't seen one for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It is a thrill when you, when you do come across one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and they are out there, but as you mentioned, there's many, many things that have kind of hurt their population. And so the state really does rely on volunteers to know the population status to see how we can manage them going forward. Mm. So keep your eye out. Keep my eye out. Yeah. Okay. I will. <laughs> but I, there's no place. I will, don't, don't think they'd be going any place to come down and, you know, a, 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 
circular drive street. You never know where they're going to show up. It's really uh, amazing um, some of the places that people are finding them. Uh, we ran the citizen science effort last year, yes. and we we received a number of sightings. So we expect to receive even more this year. Um, one of the ways people are helping a local box turtle population is through HCT by helping us preserve more land. Like you said, they have relatively small home ranges. Yes. So the acreage that we're preserving uh, is really making a difference to the local box turtle population, giving them a safe places to find food and shelter and to nest. Yeah. Now, do they have to cross Route 6? Uh, some may. Um, oh, okay. It's a little difficult. I think also there's a, for um, a decent portion of Route 6, there's a chain link fence actually on either side of the, um, the east-westbound lanes, yes. which can be quite a divide uh, or a barrier for wildlife. Um, there are partitions in the fence or holes, uh, different areas, but um, you know, that barrier has been in place for several decades now. So um, that wildlife restriction north to south across the Mid Cape has been an obstruction for quite a while. And that bothers these uh, box turtles, is that right? Yeah, plus just the speed of the traffic on that route. Yes. You know, it would be very difficult, uh, and the density or frequency of traffic. Um, right be difficult for a turtle to make across there. But they do they do try and cross our local roads. People see them. Um, okay. Yeah. Very good. And now we're going on to nightlife. Nightlife. Yeah. That's the spirit, Paul. Let's talk about nightlife. <laughs> That's right. We're gonna talk about our native nightlife walks under the full moon. Doesn't that just sound um, intriguing? Yes, Enchanting <laughs> almost. So these are a series of walks um, um, Put together by Todd Kelly, uh, a 12th generation Cape Codder, and um, Marcus Hendricks, who is Wampanoag and Native American Nipmuc heritage. There's Marcus. Um, you saw the group of people he and Todd were leading in the prior photo. These photos taken by ACD volunteer Rick Moriarty. Uh, this is uh, done in partnership with East Ham Conservation Foundation, East Ham's local land trust. We've been partnering with a number of land trusts um, around the Cape. And uh, we hold these walks in the Cape Cod National Seashore. So we're jumping out beyond the borders of Harwich, heading all the way up north uh, to the National Seashore to enjoy a walk along the bike trail. You see this portion where these amazing windswept uh, overlooks of uh, Nosset Marsh, the Nosset Marsh um, estuary. Uh, beyond um, in the, uh, on the horizon is essentially um, the barrier beach. That's the backside of Coast Guard Beach oh, okay. in East Ham and the, the Atlantic beyond that um, to the east. So um, enjoying this walk along a portion of bike trail, uh, a portion of wooded trail, also some uh, soft uh, beach sand walking. So it's a real mix of uh, walking experience. And we do it around the time of the full moon in June, July, and August. And uh, these different full moons um, have some interesting names associated with them. The June full moon is known as the strawberry moon. Well, because uh, some Native American tribes uh, recognize th uh, that full moon in June being a sign for um, the appropriate time to gather ripening fruit. Uh, the thunder moon is the full moon in July, and the sturgeon moon is the full moon in August. So these walks start at 6 p.m., uh, right around twilight, um, and move into around the 8 p.m. Um, time frame. And folks learn about Native American history associated with that time of day on the Cape. Uh, life ways of Native Americans, some of the habits around that time of day of local wildlife, as well as uh, early settlers. Uh, so it's a real neat mix of natural history information and experiencing the scenic beauty of the National Seashore. It's $15 per person. And folks can reserve right at our website, harwichconservationtrust.org. It's a, it's a really neat experience. Sounds good. Yeah. yeah very good. Right. So I guess that's it for today. That's a wrap. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thanks. And Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Many more, up we hope. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next week. Definitely. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.